This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh with part two of our discussion with Arundhati Roy, whose book, The Ministry of Utmost Happiness, her second novel, has just come out in paperback. In part one of our discussion, we talked about Arundhati Roy's new book, The Ministry of Utmost Happiness. But now I want to turn to President Trump's business partnerships in India. A recent investigation in the New Republic by journalist Anjali Kamath, headlined Political Corruption and the Art of the Deal, found that the Trump Organization has entered into more deals in India than in any other foreign country. These deals are worth an estimated $1.5 billion and produce royalties of up to to $11 million between 2014 and 2017. Anjali appeared on Democracy Now! in March and talked about the partnerships the Trump Organization has with businesses in India. That almost all of the partners um, have a long history of um, legal entanglements, have a long history of being investigated for tax evasion by the government. Um, at least three of them are very closely connected to very powerful political officials. Two of them are have close connections to powerful political officials who are in the ruling party right now, who are part of the ruling Bharatiya Janata Party, the BJP, which is the party of Prime Minister Narendra Modi. One of his partners is actually a political official himself. He's a five-term state lawmaker in Bombay, um, now called Mumbai. And Mangal Prabhat Loda is one of the wealthiest men in the country. He's also a lawmaker, um, and he shares the same kind of ideological and political vision in some ways. Um, they're both right-wing politicians, both developers who turned into politicians. His campaign slogan a couple years ago became, making Mumbai great again. Um, and both the Loda group and the other—another group in North India, in Gurgaon, called IREO, um, both of whom have ties to the ruling BJP, have also been under investigation on allegations of money laundering. So these are— you know, these might be close friends of Don Jr., but they, there's a lot of questions about how exactly they were vetted and what their reputations are. So that's journalist Anjali Khanna talking about the problems with the Trump Organization's partnerships in India. Meanwhile, Donald Trump Jr., that's President Trump's eldest son, has made repeated trips to India, most recently earlier this year. During his visit, following his sister's visit, Ivanka Trump, he was asked about corruption in India at the Global Business Summit in New Delhi. Are some sections of Indian industry willing to bend rules? Uh, but it suits them. Well, listen, I, th I think there's an entrepreneurial spirit here that is, you know... <laughs> Again, it needs no further explanation, though the media will say that I said something totally different. But so there, there's an entrepreneurial spirit here, uh, you know, that is different than elsewhere in the world. You know, I have seen changes come. You know, once I got with the right people and understood, you, you, I have seen reforms. I'm not talking policy. I'm saying as an outside businessman coming in over the couple years, you know, I have seen changes. You know, some of the reforms probably hit everyone, but they also weeded out in the real estate sector, which was, you know, if you were a developer, it was a four-letter word. Okay? There was no trust because you were promised X and you were delivered X minus, if anything at all. Uh, and, and that doesn't work in the long term. So I think there's been you know, a burden imposed on all developers. The ones who have done a good job, the ones who are well-intentioned, the ones that I'm now you know, truly friends with, yeah. they've done a good job. And they'll, they'll rise to the top anyway. It will weed out the bad players, and that needed to happen. So, Arundhati, that's uh, Donald Trump Jr., uh, Trump's eldest son, uh, speaking in Delhi in February. Uh, could you respond to, uh, first of all, the, the organizations that Anjali uh, Kamath uh, uh, spoke about in her piece, uh, the businesses in India, and what impact it's had, uh, uh, the fact that the president of the United States, his organization, has such close links uh, with these businesses, many of whom, the, the leaders of whom, have been accused of uh, of corruption. See, the, the, I read Anjali's piece. It was extraordinary. And, and what is happening in India, obviously, uh, in, in many other countries, but India, you know, again, lauded as this great democracy, the fusing of business. And most of the time, business does mean land. You know, land is the goal there, land and information. So the fusing of these two interests is not in the least bit surprising that people like Modi and Trump and their 
empires are are fusing their interests you know this uh, the the project that they were trying to do the the trump junior it involved really evicting thousands of poor people to build apartments for you know exclusive apartments for a, a very few very rich people there's nothing new about that but honestly you know the 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 level of of thievery that's going on as you know uh, nirav modi uh, who was you know photographed uh, with modi at the world economic forum has is now i think here in new york city having mm -hmm. run away after robbing a public bank of millions and millions and millions you know so uh, th these are robber barons now and in That's fact nirav modi about. whom you mentioned when his flagship store opened on madison avenue uh, which is still there donald trump junior attended the opening yeah so you can see they, these are these are uh, I, 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 I think of them just as people who, who, who are, you know, they, they, it's literally like they have these gigantic straws and they're just sucking the wealth out of, and it's, it's brutal because it doesn't matter that people are starving, people are broken, demonetization happened, all of this, it just, it just, they live in a bubble. I mean, I was looking at those visuals and I was thinking, you know, these are the people, including the people in the audience, who control, who control the economy, who control the wealth. I actually don't think that they even know how to go to a village anymore in India. Like, they don't actually physically know how to go to a village. Can you talk about the relationship or the similarities between Modi and Trump, who in both embrace each other? Um, Modi will run again uh, for prime minister next year. President Trump already began. He's campaigning regularly to run for president in the United States. But, you know, you talk about the fashion policies of Modi. Talk more about what that means. Well, uh, the, th the thing is that I feel that there's a difference between the two in as much as Trump, uh, you know, I, I, I see him being treated like a, a lunatic in the White House. All the elite institutions, including the military, the CIA, the uh, FBI, the media too, is against him, and yet your democratic principles don't have a means of dealing with a lunatic in the White House. Like, you, you don't know what to do about that, you know? Modi is not a lunatic. You know, Modi is somebody who has, as I said, been born from a process that be began, well, the modern part of it began in the 1920s. The older part of it began at the turn of the century. And in India, what you're seeing is a situation where the media is terrified. People are terrified. Bureaucrats are terrified. The Supreme Court is crumbling. I mean, for the first time in the history of the Supreme Court, four senior judges came out and held a press conference. You have a situation saying, saying, saying that democracy is in danger, say, saying that the chief justice of the Supreme Court is a man of the government who's fixing benches, you know. Uh, recently, there was a situation is unbelievable that uh, uh, in, I think it was in 2008, there was a killing of a man called Sorabuddin, claimed to be a terrorist in Gujarat. His, he was killed. His wife was killed. Later, it was found that they were taken off a bus, held in custody and killed. His wife was killed. The witness was killed. And then, and, and, uh, and one of the persons implicated in the murder is now the chief of the BJP and Modi's closest confidant uh, and, and Lieutenant Amit Shah. He was in jail for a while, released. Then there was a CBI court listening, hearing the case. The judge was sudden. One judge who asked Amit Shah to appear was transferred. The next judge who came asked Amit Shah to appear suddenly died. And now a, a magazine has exposed a trail of extremely mysterious facts which point to something terrible happened, right? The, the three friends of the, the judge, co-judges, who knew that this judge was under pressure, two of them died mysteriously. 
all that people were asking the court was, can there be an inquiry? The Supreme Court said no. So you're looking at, you know, you're looking at, of course, the massacre in Gujarat. You're looking at uh, assassinations. Now, and you're looking at institutions that will just refuse just now because the elections are coming. People who have been convicted as mass killers in the Gujarat massacre have all been released. People, uh, a man called Swami Asimanand, who was convicted in the Samjhota Express blast, has been released. Uh, there's the chief minister of UP, Swami uh, Yogi Adityanath, who openly talks about the fact that I'm just going to kill anti-social elements. So something like 400 people have just been shot down. So there is a history of all these institutions colluding, you know. You have here a situation where Trump, Trump has come out of uh, uh, what, I, what I think of, he's, he's emerged from the sewage system of something that has gone terribly wrong, you know. And, but he is a shock to the system here whereas Modi is embraced by the system, and the media is absolutely terrified. And let's talk more about the media. There was a Washington Post headline, In Modi's India, journalists face bullying, criminal cases, and worst. And then you have, in an especially high-profile case last September, the editor and publisher of a Bangalore weekly, Gaudi Lankesh, murdered. Since the 2014 election of Modi, India reportedly becoming one of the world's most dangerous countries to be a reporter. According to the 2017 Press Freedom Index compiled by Reporters Without Borders, India was ranked 136 out of 180. To give some context, the same index ranks Zimbabwe before the fall of Mugabe at 127 and Afghanistan at 120. And you have India at 136 of 180. And these are probably statistics that are gathered from journalists who have been killed or incarcerated, you know. But look at the fact that the most, the most great journalists don't have jobs. They are just out of work because nobody wants reporting. The mainstream media doesn't really want reporting, you know. And this is what is terrifying, apart from the fact that you have the social media now, you have WhatsApp, which is perhaps the biggest influencer of public opinion now, which is putting out deliberately. I mean, the BJP, many people have written about their, their WhatsApp farms, you know, where they just put out so much vitriol. And so false news, false in fact. False news, yeah. fake news, for example, now is something we all have to live with because fake news and real news are like fruit that you can buy in a supermarket. Which one do you want? You know, you can believe, and it's lovely because you can then believe whatever you want to believe. The, the, the rape of this little girl in Jammu, the, the satanic rituals around her rape and murder, you know what happened? Uh, 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 one person put out a story in a newspaper called The Sunday Guardian, giving a completely fake account of what happened. And underneath it said it's fake. But now that is tweeted and reported as real news. So you have a situation where building now, oh, the girl was not raped. Oh, the Gujarat killings did not happen. and. Everybody is plotting against us, you know. Well, well let's go uh, back to that, that that issue, elaborate on it, the recent incidents of rape in India and in Pakistan, uh, which received widespread attention in the international media. Last month, India's cabinet approved the death penalty for rapists of girls below the age of 12 after Prime Minister Narendra Modi held an emergency meeting in response to nationwide outrage in the wake of recent rape cases. According to government officials, the order also amends the law to include more drastic punishment for convicted rapists of girls below the age of 16. This comes as there were 40,000 rapes reported in 2016, and the victims in these cases were 40 percent of them were children. This is the mother of a young victim responding to the change in the law. 
इससे संतुष्ट नहीं हूँ आई एम नॉट सेटिस्फाइड विद दिस लॉ बिकॉज इट इज फाइन फॉर द माइनर्स अंडर ट्वेल्व ईयर्स ऑफ एज बट वट अबाउट द रेप विक्टम्स और अबव दैट एज सो आई फील दैट देर इज नो मोर हेरियस क्राइम दैन रेप देर इज नो लार्जर पेन नो बिगर एक्सीडेंट सो आई थिंक एवरी रेपिस्ट शुड बी हैंग्ड And then protests erupted erupt- last month over the gang rape of an eight-year-old Muslim girl that you, Arundhati, were talking about in a Hindu-dominated area of the state of Jammu and Kashmir. One of the three suspected rapists is a police officer. Authorities say the motivation for the kidnapping, rape and murder of the girl named Asifa Bano was to drive her Muslim family out of their village. Two lawmakers with the ruling BJP party were forced to resign. after they helped organize rallies in support of the accused rapists sparking widespread outcry meanwhile earlier this year there were also mass protests in pakistan following the rape and murder of zainab ansari a 7 year old girl the perpetrator imran ali was given four death sentences he was linked to murders and sexual assaults of other girls in the region by police so talk about what this what is happening in india and pakistan because of course it's not alone in india Yeah, but what um, Modi, the legislature, what people are doing about this? See, the thing is that uh, you know, it's it, it's not that uh, Modi had an emergency meeting and called for the death penalty because <coughs> he was concerned about the protests and so on. What happened was that he did not respond. when the rape actually happened when the protest began it's only after he went to england and realized it was a big issue internationally and again had to make a spectacle an appearance of doing something but the truth is first of all i'm against death penalty you know the death penalty but what what actually happens is of course there's a death pe- death penalty for mass murder all the people who who were involved in mass murder in gujarat were sentenced to death very dramatically and then released you know so really it's a question of gathering evidence of making a really strong case of taking uh, of of doing things because you really want to do them not because you want to perform on some international stage by making these empty declarations you know so the the trouble is that you know you 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 have rapes you have these brutal men who are raping women of course hindus are raping girls muslims are raping girls everybody is raping girls and so there's no question of it belonging to only one community but what is new over here is that aside from the fact that the girl was not just raped and killed she was held in a temple according to the police reports held in a temple drugged raped and then bludgeon to death there's a sort of ritualistic satanistic part to it which is terrifying you know but leaving aside the criminals the fact that people are marching in support of the rapists men and women you know are marching in support of the rapists marching demanding the charges be withdrawn this is what is frightening i mean in the course of one year there was a god man called ram rahim who was sentenced to uh, convicted of rape his supporters created havoc you know this rape the hindu ekta manch the hindu unity manch is marching in support of rapists asaram bapu another god man both these god men very close to modi uh, convicted of rape they had to have a security lockdown in three states because the people who are going to support the rapists are going to create trouble so this is something we've got to wrap our heads around you know it's gone beyond just the little girl that was raped and the the maniacs who raped her but the politi- politicization of this you know what is it what is going on after all we are in a society where it has been allowed for upper caste men to rape dalit women it is their right seen as their right you know we live in uh, 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 places like um, where places like manipur nagaland and kashmir armies officers and soldiers who have been accused of rape are protected by the armed forces special powers act you know so it is a bit naive to say you know let's not politicize it but it is political 
it is political and it has to be looked at in that way. Well, I mean, sexual violence against uh, uh, girls and women has reportedly increased uh, uh, since Modi came to power in uh, uh, 2014. So could you, you know, elaborate on that? I mean, you've given some indication now, but do you think that uh, uh, under his administration there's somehow a more permissive uh, attitude uh, uh, towards this there's, kind of there's sexual... There's a more permissive attitude to all forms of violence, right? People know that they will be protected in the end. I mean, rape, yes, but lynching too, hacking someone to death because they suspected of eating beef, hack flogging somebody because they are flogging Dalits because they are transporting dead cattle. You know, uh, every kind of violence is being support. Often the victims have cases filed against them. So as long as the perpetrator belong loosely to this Hindu family, as they call it, the, the Hindutva family, rather, they, they know that even if they go in for a few days to jail, when they come out, they will be greeted as heroes. And as we come up to the elections, you're seeing a situation where, for example, just two days ago in Gurgaon, this is just outside of Delhi, a, a, a group of thugs went and prevented Muslims from saying the namaz outdoors. Press. Right. And then the, the, they, they were arrested for a few days. There was huge protests asking for them to be released. Then they gave a decree saying that from now on, we will decide where Muslims are allowed to pray. They cannot pray outside unless it's more than 50 percent of the local population, but we'll decide. And it's being allowed and all these burners are being turned up because now, given the fact that demonetization and the new goods and services tax has broken the back of all small enterprises and local people, the only way that they're going to drum up support is through polarization. Let me just go to that, the, the issue of, of demonetization. Uh, this was implemented in November 2016 and became one of the more unpopular policies implemented by the Modi government. In a surprise television announcement then, Prime Minister Modi declared that all 500 and 1,000 rupee notes would no longer be, quote, legal tender. The move, which came to be called demonetization, applied to 86 percent of the value of all currency in circulation. The Modi government said the initiative was aimed at eliminating black money, that is, unaccounted, untaxed wealth, as well as targeting fake currency and terror financing. The, mood w the move was widely condemned, and in response, the Modi government said demonetization would also help India switch from cash to digital money. Demonetization impacted in particular hundreds of millions of people employed by India's vast informal sector that deals predominantly in cash. It also had ruinous consequences for the primarily cash-reliant rural economy. And last year, the former governor of the Reserve Bank of India, Raghuram Rajan, also criticized the decision, saying, anybody who knows India knows that very quickly quickly, we find ways around the system. Essentially, all the money that was demonetized came back into the system, and it didn't have the direct effect that a lot of people would fess up and pay taxes." Unquote. Um, so can you elaborate on the impact of this demonetization, who it helped, who it hurt? Well, the thing is that uh, that announcement was made very uh, soon, just before the UP election, the Uttar Pradesh elections. Uttar Pradesh is the largest state in India, and the elections and who rules Uttar Pradesh usually, you know, uh, means who rules India. So what it did was to suddenly become a body blow to every single other political party. Only the BJP had money. And today, that is the truth, that no political party has any money or hardly any money except for the BJP. So in the coming elections, it is going to be, uh, uh, you know, one party with all the money versus everyone else who's scrabbling around for some sort of monetary foothold. But 
apart from the economics of it, as we know, the, the economics of it, were, it was just nonsense. You know, I mean, mm. even the finance minister doesn't seem to have known this was going to happen, although certainly people in the BJP seem to have known and have taken steps to protect their own wealth. But look at the implications. I mean, this has never been done ever in history, mm. that somebody can come out and overnight declare all 86 percent of the currency illegal. Currency is a social contract between a government and its citizens. So it was like breaking the spine of every Indian and seeing whether you can break it. So you your know? money is worthless. Yeah. But and once you, it's your worthless. Your physical money is worthless. Is worthless. You have to go to the bank, deposit it. I was, in fact, in rural India when this happened. It was just awful, you know, to see. And people don't have bank accounts, women who have collected money in their, you know, saris and folded it away. Everything, you know, just, it, it was just devastating. But what I'm saying is, apart from all of that, even if it had been a great economic policy, how does a democracy allow someone to do that? And once you've done that, today look at Indians. Everyone is wondering, what is he going to do next? He can do anything. If he can do this, he can do anything. So wait, right? can I just, can we just understand, in a parliamentary system, the parliament doesn't have to approve uh, uh, the moves, massive policy changes uh, by how, the prime minister? I, I mean, I just don't understand how this was allowed to happen. But of course, they had such a huge majority. So it went through. I mean, he just came up and announced it, mocking people, you know, saying, oh, well, you know, now there is a wedding in the family, but sorry, there's going to be no cash, and laughing about it, you know. Mm -hmm. But this is what I mean, you know, about, a, it's a kind of micro-fascism, you know. Can I just control the very individual at every stage? And having done that, you have put the fear into people of what is going to happen next. The mm -hmm. other big thing which we haven't spoken about is the government's idea of the Aadhaar card, the mm -hmm. unique identity card. Biometric. Biometric, mm -hmm. where every piece of private information is going to be stored in this database forever, whichever <coughs> government comes or doesn't come, available to be hacked by anybody. I mean, the whole world is reeling about how data is being hacked and stolen. And here, this is how you're going to control everything and everyone at an individual level, you know? But well, what's the government's uh, explanation for why Aadhaar is needed? Oh, they're saying that this is, uh, you know, so that we can, uh, we can distribute um, uh, rations to the poor. I mean, everyone has an election card. You don't need biometric data to distribute rations if you really want to distribute la rations. But as we know, you're, you're destroying the livelihood of the poor and then pretending that collecting data is some missionary service. It's ridiculous, you know. We wanted to end, Arundhati, by asking you a little more about Edward Snowden and your trip to Moscow. Um, but with the latest news, this voter profiling system, Cambridge Analytica, is going bust now. They're closing mm. down. Um, they gained international attention after Facebook revealed it acquired the personal information of 87 million Americans without their permission as part of an effort to um, push for the support of President Trump. Now, Edward Snowden uh, just recently made comments about media surveillance and new technologies uh, that are combining to target people and influence elections. He called this the greatest redistribution of power since the Industrial Revolution. Talk about your trip to see him. Yeah, you have a book out, um, Things That Can and Cannot Be Said, Essays and Conversations. You went there with the renowned whistleblower Dan Ellsberg, famous for releasing the Pentagon Papers, and the actor John Cusack. It was, uh, it was really not something that I had planned or anything. You know, Dan and John were going and they asked me to come and I, I went along. And it was fascinating because Edward was ahead of the curve, I think, in terms of understanding that data is the new wealth. Data is the new gold. You know, you, information is, is, is worth everything now. And of course, uh, you know, having, having lived in Kashmir and 
I mean, having visited Kashmir and being to Basar, I know, I know uh, how much surveillance. Um, in India, we are very aware of the fact that our cell phones are our coordinates, and you know, people are listening in, and every militant that's killed, and every uh, assassination that happens, the court hearings just full of IMEI numbers and uh, SMSs and cell phone messages and so on. But I, what I, are IMEI the, the, the unique identity of a cell phone, I see. Uh, the instrument itself, you know. But, uh, but I think that uh, Ed, Ed, uh, Edward Snowden really um, uh, understands, and I, I do agree with him, and I wish uh, he listens to the show, and I want him to pay attention to Aadhaar. He has tweeted about the UID Aadhaar. It will be the biggest data gathering, centralization of data the world has ever seen. You know, now we're talking about one billion people's data, bank accounts, medical, everything will be on record. And recently, the state government of Andhra Pradesh actually released by accident all the Aadhaar numbers of its citizens, you know, so anyone could browse the net and look up their personal data. You can blackmail, you can do anything. And it's not just governments that can do it. People can do it to each other. It's, it's just a, a nightmare from hell. It's like a science fiction film. But what kind of opposition has there been? Uh, well, this? right now the court uh, hearing is on. But the trouble is that, you know, it's so hard for people to understand the depth of this. Mm -hmm. You know, like always, I mean, even when we were fighting on the issue of the dam, until the dam is built, the lands are flooded, the irrigation isn't working, only then people realize uh, what it really means, you know. Mm -hmm. So, in a way, to alert people in advance to something like this that you can't really wrap your head around is 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 still uh, very difficult, you know. But there is opposition. I mean, people, especially groups of young people, are working very, very hard mm -hmm. to convince the court not to make it compulsory. But the court has, again, you know, been playing this game of delaying the hearings. And while they delay the hearings, the government's saying, oh, you need an Aadhaar card for your gas connection, you need an Aadhaar card for your phone connection. The bank goes on messaging you 10 times a day saying, please link your account with this. You can't get uh, X, Y, or Z services without an Aadhaar card. You, you know, people who are starving, who need rations from the government, are told to produce Aadhaar cards. They don't have internet connections there. They don't know, you know, uh, someone is standing in line and their fingerprints are worn because they are peasants. So they say, okay, why don't you give your print? It's just anarchy, you know, and mm. and to try and discipline an ocean like that, to digitize an ocean like that, that lives in several centuries simultaneously, is going to cause violence of an unimaginable level. Mm. Um, Arundhati, Edward Snowden told you in Moscow, if we do nothing, we sort of sleepwalk into a total surveillance state. We have both, where we have both a super state that has unlimited capacity to apply force with an unlimited ability to know about the people it is targeting. And that's a very dangerous combination. That's the dark future, he said. It's true. And the thing about it is that it's permanent. It doesn't matter then whether it's Trump or Obama or Modi or Rahul Gandhi or whoever. That data is there to be used by people with all kinds of intentions, good and bad. But it is an absolute calamity. And finally, just the description of meeting with Ed Snowden in Moscow, how did you do it? Well, uh, we, we uh, were speaking to, to each other on an encrypted chat. And uh, I, in fact, when I was spending some time with John Cusack and we spoke, and uh, so we just decided to go and it was all set up uh, by, um, by the uh, civil liberties folks here. And uh, we went and met him, I mean- With I, Dan Ellsberg. With Dan. And it was, I think they were, 
very pleased to meet each other. John and I were more like the wallpaper <laughs> because they had all this spy talk going on, you know, and it was really fascinating. In fact, uh, there's much more to our encounter that then was published uh, in this little book, Things That Can and Cannot Be Said, and I hope it'll come out at some point. Cause, and uh, how did it talk about being in Moscow and wanting to come home to the United States? Well, what at that, that mean? point, at that point, I think he was still hopeful that something would happen and he would be able to come back. He's a very level-headed person, you know, for his age. But I think, uh, you know, I think he probably knows that he's, he's, you know, he's a, he's a person surrounded by, uh, you know, the oligarchs of Russia and the oligarchs of America and the you know, he lives on a hope and a prayer, you know, and uh, uh, he's a very brave, brave person and a very smart person, but uh, in a very difficult place right now, he, I think. He will be always in a very difficult place. You. But uh, whatever he did is something which the world is just beginning to catch up with now, I think. Uh, the title of the book is Things That Can and Cannot Be Said. Uh, can you say something about what cannot be said? Well, uh, you know, at that point, when I, uh, when I uh, met him, I wasn't just going there as an acolyte. You know, I had some questions which were to do with, um, I suppose, you know, people who live in, in that world of the Internet, uh, 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 you know, there's, a, there's another world that I live in, which which has smells and mud and earth and bullets and whatever. And I was sort of having a conversation about how, after the history of what America has done, you know, starting with the bombing of Hiroshima, could you still have faith in it and join the CIA, given how you think now? So there's a lot of talk about about that, you know, whether the war in Iraq was genocidal or not. And I do believe it was genocidal based on fake news, really, you know. And uh, so I think maybe uh, there were there were there was it, it was it was wonderful to talk to him. I asked him what he meant by being wrapped up in that American flag, you know, uh, which means uh, which means different things to different people, and how did the politics of what he was saying gel with doing something like that? And, uh, you know, it was quite charming. He said, oh, you know, these photographers, they just brought it, and I just did it. I was really like, I don't know if I would just do it, you know, wrap myself in the Indian flag or something. So there were things, and I, I think at that point in time when he was still trying to to negotiate a return, there may have been things that he agreed with me about which would have been detrimental to those negotiations. Mm. <laughs> well, Arundhati Roy, we want to thank you so much for being with us. Arundhati Roy, author of the novel The Ministry of Utmost Happiness. It's just come out in paperback. She is winner of, among many honors, the Booker Prize in 1997 for her first novel, The God of Small Things. To see part one of our discussion, go to democracynow.org. And to see a more extended discussion of the book, you can go there as well, when the hardcover first came out. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. Thanks so much for joining us.